It'd be so helpful to still have your Bibles open at Luke chapter 24. Today, as we begin a new four-week series, so the series is called The Advent of God, which is just a fancy way of saying the coming of God. So in this season of Advent, we prepare to celebrate Christmas, so the first coming of Christ, with eyes and hearts set on the return of Jesus. So that's where we begin today. It'd be really helpful as you have your Bibles open that you might like to have it at chapter 24, but we're going to actually be picking up a few sections in Luke today, so you're going to have to do some work moving around. There's also an outline on the back of the news, so if that's of help to you, there's points there in English, Korean, Dinka, and Simplified Chinese. But right now, let's pray and ask for God's help. Gracious Father... Thank you so much that you've revealed yourself to us over and over again. By your word, in your actions, through your son, and in the power of your spirit. Lord, would you please help us this very day to hear and obey your voice as we eagerly await the return of your son in glory. In Jesus' name, amen. In 1961, when the Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first person in space, the Soviets claimed that they had ascended to the heavens but found no evidence for God there. Nikita Khrushchev, who was the Soviet leader, said Gagarin Gagarin flew into space but didn't see any God. In effect, we've been to the highest of heights and God, well, God is not there Therefore, God must not be real. C.S. Lewis, the great C.S. Lewis, who was alive at the time, when he heard this, he wrote an essay pointing out just how foolish this type of thinking really is. That if God is real, that we wouldn't relate to him simply as a, a person on the first floor might relate to someone on the hundredth floor to which we need to ascend. No, Lewis says, if God does exist... He is related to the universe more as an author is related to a play. God relates to us the way Shakespeare might relate to Hamlet, that the only way that Hamlet can know about Shakespeare is if the author writes himself into the play. Tim Keller puts it like this. Shakespeare is the creator of Hamlet's world and of Hamlet himself. Hamlet can know about Shakespeare only if the author reveals information about himself in the play. So too, the only way to know about God is if God has revealed himself. And of course, that is exactly what God has done. Actually, it's even better. For God hasn't merely written information about himself to us, but he has written himself into the drama of history, into our lives over and over again. From creation to new creation, God has been revealing himself to us. At Christmas, we we look back and we rejoice that God has burst into our world in Jesus. We look presently and we give thanks for his presence and the power of his spirit. And we look forward with eager anticipation of his return. As we uh, approach Christmas over the next four weeks, that's what we're focusing on this Advent. The word advent is just from the Latin adventus. It simply means coming. And from the earliest of times, Christians celebrated God's coming into the world in Christ. How? By looking forward, by faithfully waiting for when he will come again. In fact, traditionally, the church calendar doesn't begin with January 1, but it begins with the season of advent. So if you thought 2024 was rushing, you know, towards us at great speed, got really good news, happy new year today, actually. Our year begins with waiting for the God who will come in glory, for the God who came as promised, for the God who came in person, and as we begin today, for the God who came in Scripture's story. That's where we begin. How has God revealed himself to us in the scriptures, in the Bible? And particularly for us, how we're going to approach that today is, how does Jesus help us make sense of that? Not that every single individual verse in the Bible is specifically about Jesus, 
but that as a whole, the whole Bible points to and is fulfilled in him. And so as Christians approach the Bible, we do so through the lens of Jesus. That's our method. Not because we think it's a really brilliant or snazzy sort of idea, but because it's precisely what Jesus did and what the first Christians did. Now, if we were looking at this at a theological college, so if you went off to Bible college and you want to understand how we see Christ in the Scriptures, that would be the Christology of of the Bible, uh, we would take perhaps a whole semester or perhaps a whole degree to do that. Instead, today, we're just going to do it in one sermon and we're going to look at three occasions. So think of these as three acts when Jesus takes the Scriptures and he shows us how they're fulfilled and they find their amen in him. That's our approach today. That's our method. And as we do that, through Jesus, we see that God comes to fulfill, God comes to forgive, and God comes with a future. So first, we see that God comes to fulfill. On the first day of the week after Jesus' crucifixion, when some of the women faithfully show up at the tomb to care for the body, not only do they discover that the tomb is empty but they hear from some angels that Jesus has risen. Some of the other disciples also see that the tomb is empty for themselves. But as word spreads, as word gets around, it really becomes the whole talk of the region, not just the talk of the town, but the talk of the region, as you kind of expect it would. In fact, as two of the disciples, so Cleopas and Simon, as we heard in Luke chapter 24, as they're making their way to Emmaus, And as Jesus comes alongside them, that's what they're discussing. They haven't seen this for themselves yet. They've got all the feelings and they can't quite figure out, they can't make sense of what's happening. They hope that Jesus would be the one to bring salvation, but he's been crucified. They thought that Jesus was dead, but now some are claiming that he's risen, that he's alive. And so they're pretty bamboozled. And it's into that situation that Jesus responds alongside them, them not being able to recognise him yet, in chapter 25 of Luke 24, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets... He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Jesus is saying, don't you guys get it? Don't you realise why the Messiah had to suffer and then be glorified? Note that Jesus doesn't appeal to all those warnings that he'd already given his disciples about his death and resurrection. But he says that you should have anticipated this You should be able to see how it all comes together now for your scriptures, so largely what we know is our Old Testament, for your scriptures anticipated, pointed and strained towards me and what has happened. When Jesus says Moses and the prophets, he's referring to two out of three of the major sections of what we now know as the Old Testament. Moses, or the writings of Moses, is a reference to the Law, the, the first five books of the Bible from Genesis to Deuteronomy. The prophets here include Joshua, Kings, the history books, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, along with the, the 12 minor prophets. And then later on, verse 44, Jesus also refers to the third major section, which is the section of the writings. And so Jesus' point is that they wouldn't be confused about all of these recent events if they'd only understood nor had been so slow to believe all that the Scriptures have spoken. They've kind of cherry-picked them. So what does Jesus do? He explains to them what was said in all the Scriptures concerning himself. So this is actually the first ever lecture in Old Testament Christology of how the Old Testament points to Jesus, how it points to the Christ, the the King. And the lecturer is pretty qualified. He's preeminently qualified, as it turns out, for he happens to be Christ, the King. This is actually one of those times in the Gospels where I really wish I could have been there, just walking alongside, listening. It would have been really helpful, or at least if there had been some sort of recording and I could watch the talk back later, that would be awesome. 
I mean, just imagine how much content Jesus must have packed into this little walk to Emmaus. It actually, it wasn't that far, the walk, so I wonder if they were going really slowly or took some sort of detour to, to get it all in. But I want you to know that whilst Luke gives us a summary of what happened, that the headline of what happened, that the scriptures point to him and all that had happened, he doesn't record any of the details. Did you, did you note that? Now, there's actually plenty of places in the New Testament when the writers do really connect and detail the dots between the Old Testament and Jesus. In the Gospels, even themselves, Jesus almost continuously quotes from the Scriptures. But Luke doesn't unpack the whole conversation here. You know, I want a transcript of what was said. I've got to wonder, what, Luke, were you doing? But perhaps the reason he doesn't is because he's less concerned with us working out all the little pieces and far more concerned with us seeing the pattern and the point of who Jesus is and what he's done. He's showing us something really important. He's showing that if you want to make sense of all that's been revealed to us through the scriptures, if you want to make sense of the history of God's actions from creation and into the future, if you want to make sense of the story of God's people, if you want to know your part in God's unfolding story, then you'll only ever begin to see that clearly if you come to it through Jesus. If you're not sure about Jesus or you're not sure about the claims of Christianity, I really want to encourage you, come through, consider the claims of Jesus first. Now, we don't use that method because it seems clever or it's particularly virtuous or something like that. But see, that's precisely what Jesus did. When the Hubble telescope was launched back in the uh, 1990s, very soon after it was launched, the scientists discovered that actually all the images were blurry. They were all out of focus because the, the primary mirror in the telescope was, uh, was broken. There was a problem with it. Now, to fix this, they couldn't just sort of remotely control it or something like that, but they actually had to send astronauts into space on the space shuttle to do a spacewalk and go fix it, to go get it going. But when they did finally get it going and they started to receive the images back from the telescope, the images were crystal clear. They had stunning, stunning images of, of distant galaxies to the point in which they helped us understand the universe like we never have before. As the disciples walk to Emmaus, the universe has fallen apart. Nothing now seems to make sense. But Jesus showed them, and he shows us, that he is the key. He is the linchpin. He doesn't just bring our, our vision into focus, but he brings cohesion to the entire universe. We don't have to go somewhere searching for him because Jesus has come to us. Trying to understand God without looking to Jesus is like expecting the Hubble telescope to work without its primary mirror. Paul, writing to the Colossians, puts it like this. The sun is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things in heaven or on things on earth, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Every longing, every need, everything is fulfilled in him. Through Jesus we see that God has come to fulfill, but also that God comes to forgive. If you've got your Bible open, we'll flick back just two chapters to Luke chapter 22 and pick up at verse 14. The night before Jesus died, we read, 
When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfilment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. As the disciples celebrated the Passover, all the words that were spoken, or the typical words that were spoken, would have been incredibly familiar to them. Passover was the time in which they recalled God's rescue of their ancestors out of Egypt. When they baked bread without yeast, in anticipation of a a really hurried departure, when they sacrificed a lamb with its blood covering the doorposts, and the image was that as God's judgment passed over that place, the judgment would pass over them, would pass by them, that they would be spared. They would have recalled and recited and sung the words since childhood. The Passover had been celebrated for over 1,500 years. But on that Passover, Jesus does something altogether surprising. He takes these very familiar words, precious words, and he makes them about himself. As Jesus celebrates this meal, which points back to all that had happened in the past, he says, in effect, it's actually also about me, about what I'm about to do. It really points to and encapsulates an even greater redemption, an even greater rescue as he saves not just from oppressive forces of earthly regimes into the promised land, but he saves them from evil, sin and death into his everlasting kingdom. He deals with these things once and for all. As Fleming Rutledge puts it, if God is going to exclude violence and injustice from his coming kingdom, then something has to be done about violence and injustice and every form of enmity that seeks to thwart God's purposes. These things are manifestations of sin and death and cannot be overlooked or ignored. God must deal with them. Either we need to pay the cost, suffer the judgment, and bear the consequence, which we cannot, or God would step in for us. Why must the son suffer and die? because it's through his death that he would forge the way of forgiveness for us, that his body would be broken for them, of his blood which would be shed for us, for a new covenant, for a new way of being in relationship with God through him. The people had really longed, so longed for a time when that would be possible, when they would be his people and he would be their God, when justice would really be done, when the whole world, every aspect of the world, would be set right. It's actually the problem that was waiting for a resolution since Genesis chapter 3, since humanity is turning away from God. But if God just turned a blind eye to sin, then he would not be just. And if God judged us all according to our sin, then none of us would have any hope. But at the cross, God in his grace forged a way for forgiveness. At the cross, all of our hopes for mercy and justice are fulfilled. At the cross, justice and mercy come rushing together. Note that Jesus says, verse 16, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfilment in the kingdom of God. Verse 18, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. So hear what Jesus is saying. Not only is his death imminent, which they weren't expecting, but that his death and resurrection are central. They are right at the heart of the cause of his coming into the world. I think it's really interesting that the disciples on the road to Emmaus, they they don't recognise Jesus. It says they are prevented from seeing 
who Jesus is, until when? Until he broke the bread with them. That's, that's the light bulb moment that they had. That's when it made sense. That's why every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, like we're celebrating the Lord's Supper today, it's like the gospel in edible form. If you've ever doubted that God takes the problems of our world seriously, look at the cross. If you've ever doubted that God loves you, simply look at the cross. Jesus calls us to repent, to turn from our sin, and to turn to him and believe. And we can trust him, how we can trust him. For God didn't merely reveal himself as some sort of public display of information, like a billboard or a message or an Instagram live or something like that, but he gave us himself. God comes to fulfill, God comes to forgive, and finally God comes with the future. It's the final and never-ending chapter of the greatest story ever told of creation, fall, redemption, and new creation. So back one chapter again, Luke chapter 21, verse 25. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus says, There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world. For the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Now, we're going to spend a whole week looking at Jesus' future coming in glory, but but in the meantime, don't miss Jesus' promise. He is returning, and when it comes, it will be in glory. I think it's uh, it's a bit easy to get distracted or bogged down with some of the sort of end-time language, the apocalyptic type of language that we read here of sun, moon, stars, of anguish and perplexity. People can get really caught up with trying to decipher, decode, or predict these things. But please don't miss what is central. There is an end coming. God will bring about new creation through judgment. And this future all centers on Jesus' return. When his glory will be revealed. When his identity will be plain to see. It's nothing less, in the very words of Jesus, as the renewal of of all things. Chris Wright puts it like this. The crucifixion was a disaster unless or until you see in the light of the plan of God himself when it takes central place. The resurrection is nonsense unless or until you see it in light of the plan of God himself when it takes central place. This is not just a plan for individual salvation, but a plan for the redemption of the whole of creation. The great hope of a new heavens and a new earth, which was revealed first to Isaiah, is fulfilled in the return of Jesus. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Whose voice is that? The one whose resurrection guarantees our future. We wait for the one who hasn't just told us about himself, he's given himself to us to fulfill, to forgive, and with a future. Let's pray. Gracious Father, how we thank you so much that in order to know you, that we don't need to launch an expedition to space or embark upon some sort of journey of discovery because you have revealed yourself to us, because you have come to us, because you have given yourself to us. This Advent, Lord, as we prepare to celebrate Christmas, would you please help us to wait patiently 
in eager anticipation of your return, proclaiming your good news in the power of your spirit today. In Jesus' name, amen.